Well, welcome back to the roundtable of Sycamore Hills Baptist Church. This is the staff of Sycamore Hills Baptist Church in Independence, Missouri. We've been going through a series of studies on the letters of John, and this session will be on 1 John chapter 3, 11 through 24, finishing out that chapter. So we are glad that you're with us. Let me introduce our staff once again in the upper left-hand corner. You have Tony Persley, who's Associate Pastor of Music and Education. Down at the bottom is Doug Winkler, who's Associate Pastor of Family and Youth. And I am Willie Davis, the Senior Pastor at Sycamore Hills Baptist Church. So let me uh, lead us in a word of prayer, and then Doug is going to read us the first section that we're going to be studying this morning, this afternoon. So uh, join me in prayer, please. Father, thank you for the privilege that you give us once again to share in this roundtable. Father, we pray that it will be profitable to those that are listening in as well as profitable to us. Let us be taught ourselves first before we uh, ever be a vessel of communication to others. So thank you for this privilege. Guide us in our discussion. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. One thing before Doug reads, we do not rehearse this. We do not practice this. So uh, all of our mistakes are our own. We have that here. So Doug, lead us off and take us from verse 11, I think, down through verse 15. Sure. And I'm reading out of the uh, Christian Standard Bible. And this is what it says. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer as eternal life residing in him. This is our introduction into this section. Uh, one of the main words that appears in this part of First John is the word love. I think it appears something like eight times. Uh, and six of them in relationship are love to each other. A couple of times in God's love for us. Uh, I think there's even a time in there we might just make it generically that it's the attitude that we are to have. So mm -hmm. let's plunge in and let's take a look at these verses and see in particular this love one to another that we have here. So gentlemen, what should we observe in these verses? Well, uh, the, the first observation that I would make is just like lots of other times when we when we look at passages like this, is that it, it begins with a word that should cue us that there are some things that have come before that we need to have in mind. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a ground here that for, so, so this is, this is grounding something that's come before where John has talked about who are the, those who are the children of God and those who are the children of the devil and mm -hmm. those who are born of God are the ones who practice righteousness and those who are of the devil are the ones who make a practice of sin. Mm -hmm. And there's that contrast between righteousness and sin. And, and then John at the end of verse 10 makes it very clear that the one who does not practice righteousness uh, is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And uh, that's really where we find ourselves when we, when we get to where we are in verse 11 is this continual unpacking of what it, what it is, what's a characteristic of one who's been born of God, mm -hmm. that they make a practice of righteousness. And then particularly here, I think that, that it's, it's the righteousness expressed in love towards the brothers. Um, and, and then we're going to have, we have a contrast again here uh, when we get to that. Um, we, we, John had told us before about the devil and what he was like, that he was uh, a liar from the beginning. Um, and, and now we're going to be introduced to someone who is of the devil mm -hmm. as an, as an example of what we're not to be like. We're not to be, we're not to be like Cain. Um, 
and uh, the the expression, the outworking of of being of the wicked one was that he murdered his brother. And, and the word that's used for murder is really, really um, descriptive. Uh, it could be translated to butcher, to slaughter. Um, so I, I think that that really, I mean, murder flows out of malice, but I think that just kind of uh, gives us a real vivid depiction of, of just what kind of hatred was present in Cain because he was of the evil one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the reasoning for it is that his deeds were wicked and his brother's deeds were righteous. Uh, that I, I think I'll just stop there and let you guys kind of unpack that some. Well, and, and I'm, Something before before we do that, I want to look back at you know the beginning in verse eleven is this major thing that he had said in John in, in John one fifteen. This is the message you've heard you've heard from the beginning, and we need to remember the context and who John is writing to. He's writing to a group of people where there have been some false teachers that have entered in, and they've been teaching something that is not right, true about Christ. They are not demonstrating love. They're not demonstrating obedience. All these things that John has been addressing. So he's reminding them that the message he's giving is the original one, the one that came from Christ mm -hmm. himself. And we see lots of uh, the gospel of John making its way into John's um, mm -hmm. John's writing, reminding this comes from Christ. And this is who this is from. This is nothing new. This is nothing new fangled that we think that the, the teachers are bringing in. This is the same message that we've heard from the beginning. I'm not giving you anything new. And certainly with what he says about love and loving one another, um, fits mm -hmm. right in with what with the gospel, the emphasis that Jesus has on love and loving one another, and the idea that the hate truly can lead to murder, and that it is a, a companion of that, if not a, a foretaste of murder. Um, hate will lead to, to murder, and so I think one of the things we see we've seen also in John, and we see it here, is that John, for John, is black and white. Um, I think it was, it was a stop that I was reading, and he said that. John's already referenced, of course, loving one another. And he said, John's filling this in. He's coloring it in, but his only colors are black and white. Um, John doesn't allow for uh, different yep. shades. This is true. It's not that there are different shades. You either love your brothers and sisters in Christ or you don't. But if you don't love them, then it's hard to say that the spirit of God lives within you. It's hard to say mm -hmm. that you are truly a believer. Mm -hmm. Um and I think it's interesting, he says, do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. And we, that shouldn't surprise us. And we know that Jesus Jesus references that in John 15, 18, the world hated yep. him. Well, if they hated him, then, it sh then they're gonna, it, it's going to hate us as well. So John's saying, if there's hate anywhere, the hate should be in the, from the world to you, not between you and your brothers and sisters in Christ. Yep. Sure. That yep. That's acting like the world. Mm-hmm which John has already condemned clearly throughout, throughout this book. Yep. And he's seeing instead what will set us apart. What will be very different is the fact that we have love for one another. And in fact, and, and it goes on again, the times that he says, we know throughout this book is just tremendous, but we have it here in verse 14. We know that mm -hmm. we have passed from death to life. Again, this confidence that John's bringing forth this assurance. Yep. And why do we know that? And of course, the, there are other things as well that you could reference, but John specifically has says, it. why do we know that? Because we love our brothers and sisters. The natural thing for us to do is to hate. That's what the world does. Um, and it hates those who are righteous. But we, on the other hand, we love our brothers and sisters. We're acting so differently from what is natural to us and natural to the world and natural to people who do not know Christ. That that is evidence then to us and to the world that we have indeed passed from death to life, that we have been born again, that we have this new life in Christ. Yeah. That's how powerful of a message this is. And of course, we have to go back to you know John 13, 34 and 35, where Jesus said, that is indeed how the world will know you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so that, again, this is John referencing so much of what we see in the Gospel of John. This is from Jesus. Uh, this is not from me. This is nothing else. You want the ultimate authority? It's not me. It's Jesus himself. Yeah. I walked with him. This is what he said. I'm simply reminding you of the truths laid out by Christ when he was here. 
don't fall for the new stuff. Yep. Listen to the old stuff. As you were talking, there are, there are two or three things that, that log into my mind. Tony, you mentioned the murder. Uh, I think this really emphasizes the degree of importance that loving one another is. Yep. That John would use the illustration of murder in here. Yep. He doesn't say uh, you need to love your brother because we know that so-and-so lied to someone or so-and-so deceived someone. He murdered. Uh, yeah. which, by using that illustration, gives great weight to the command that we have here. Yes. And, and as you're looking at this and you're considering this, you, you also have this wonderful statement of assurance, and, and Doug, you referenced this, uh, verse 14, this should be part of our assurance of salvation. Yeah. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Uh, we, we have put all together a whole bunch of man-made assurances of salvation. Here is mm -hmm. the biblical assurance of salvation. If right. you're not loving the brethren, yeah. uh, then they're, you're not part, that's that contrast, Tony, that you brought out. You're, you're not part of the children of God. And a kind of a third thing that's kind of hidden in here to me is don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Yeah. What is the degree of the hate is that they see you loving the brethren. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not that they hate you because of uh, necessarily something else, but, but they see the interaction that you have with yeah. the brethren. Uh, that, that is the degree of, and I, I would say that in America right now, the angst against evangelical Christianity isn't because people are watching us and saying, you guys love each other. <laughs> uh, they're saying it's because you hate so much. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. here is a, is a, a very weighty yeah. statement in the middle of this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other, the other striking thing is uh, the way that John talks about that, that we, we have passed from death into life. Mm -hmm. That we now reside in in the land of the living. Yeah. We, 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 you, you, you talk about this all the time, Willie. Uh, eternal life is, is not just a quantity of life, but it's a quality of life, right? It's, it's we, now, we now live, we're now alive. We were dead. And, and then just those who do not love, and particularly uh, who do not love the brothers, uh, abide in death. Like they're already living in the realm of the dead. And we, we know that that's been true since the beginning because uh, Paul writes in Romans 5 that uh, death came through sin and so death spread to all because all sinned. Right? There, every human being that's ever been born since the fall has been born in death. Mm -hmm. um, but we, uh, and that's the assurance part, we, we have passed from that, realm of the dead into life we are now in christ it doesn't mean that we won't physically die in the present order of things um but that we do have eternal life now and one day we will be raised and and that mm -hmm. resurrection power will be made very tangible and in, in, in that concrete way uh, but it's just striking how john talks about those in an already present form and not just a somewhere out there form uh, you know, look down the road. That's where it is. No, we're actually residing there now. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think Tony relation that we have passed, as you said, from death, that, that's an event that's occurred. Um, but the one who does not love remains, that's their current state as well. Yes. Which is, again, the state of, of normalcy for people, as, yep. as you pointed out. Um, and so, you know, I, I think about the world hates us or the, the world should hate us because we love the brethren. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it hates us enough currently. Mm. I think they see us acting like them because I think one of the issues, and if we look at the church, and I don't mean Sycamore Hills Baptist Church, I mean the church universal and the, maybe the Western church in particular to be more specific, 
what we're seeing is we're seeing brothers and sisters as supposed brothers and sisters hating each other. And yep. in the areas of social media and in every other way, we're seeing attacks and we're seeing mm -hmm. um, preferencing for things of the, for even things outside of the body of Christ over the people of, of Christ. And uh, that if that mm -hmm. condemns people, yep. uh, that condemns us in feeling what Christ has commanded us to do. And in fact, I think as we get further down, the warning is pretty stern. I, I, I can't think, you know, verse Verse 15 is a really stern warning. Everyone who hates yep. his brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Right. Or in verse 14, the one who does not love remains in death. Yep. Um, so I think that some of us within the realm of Christianity need to be really serious and say, what is going on? Because yep. there are no, again, there, there's no gray area here. Right. Um, it is really clear that um, this is what what it should be, and this is what it should look like. Now, is John cri critiquing the, the false teachers without question? But they're not mm -hmm. truly of the faith. So he's doing what a shepherd should do, which is protecting the sheep from the wolves. And yep. so you do that in whatever means necessary to do that. But within the family of God, within people that we yeah. would say, yes, we share a common faith. Yeah. I think this scripture makes us say, what in the world are we doing? Yeah. yeah. I think, Doug, when I was when I was talking about the world hates you because they don't see you loving the brethren. Uh, somebody stepping into the church mm -hmm. sure, yes. says, "What I see among the relationships of the people within the church is no different than what I see in the world." Mm -hmm. uh, you talk forgiveness, but I don't see yeah. forgiveness. Yeah. You talk humility, but I don't see humility. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You you talk peace, but I don't see peace. You talk about yeah. not being jealous, but I see jealousies. Yeah. And so then they walk away and they say, well, uh, that's that's hypocrisy altogether. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. And that's the thing about Jesus that made people so uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Why were the Pharisees so uncomfortable, outraged even at Jesus it was because of the way that he loved. Yeah. And, and the way that he interacted with people and you hold that up as a mirror to somebody and, and it helps them in one sense to see how unrighteous they are, how ugly they really are. And you have two options. You either repent and cry out for mercy or you you seek to destroy that which is making you so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Before we move on to the next section, I want to point out one other contrast in here. We have the contrast of, of those who are children of God and not, but there's an interesting little thing with John's, one of John's favorite words of abiding. Yeah. You have at the end of verse 14, whoever does not love abides in death. Yep. In verse 15, that Nober has eternal life abiding in him. Yeah. And you have this very strong abiding in Christ message in here. Yep. Uh, Let's take this next section, 16 through 18, because the focus changes uh, mm -hmm. a little bit. And we talk about how we, we know love. So, Tony, uh, why don't you read us 16 through 18? Sure. Um, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. For the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him? How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. We have another one of those connectors. By this we know love. Uh, yeah. Tying all of this together. Uh, that really this, the central issue of the central demonstration of love is the cross yeah. And, yeah. The, and the work of Christ. So, just in these three verses, what's he bringing into this conversation that we need to know? Well, he's bringing in the big guns. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that he brings in Jesus and says, again, I, I, I'm going to, this is what he did. And, you know, I, and I thought of that phrase in, in John where G, when Jesus washes their feet and he says, you know, you should do the same. And it's kind of what John's doing here. He's saying he laid down his life for us. We should lay our, down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Yeah. And that's a big one. It's easy for us sometimes, especially in our culture today, where we don't have to do that, to say, oh, yeah, I, I would do that. 
Yeah. And John's speaking corporately there. And then he gets really individualized and says, if anyone, so now that you personally with another person sees, has the world's goods and sees a fellow believer. So no longer can you say with the church as a whole, now I'm looking at you as an individual, Mm -hmm. but withhold compassion from him. How does God's love reside in him? I mean, how is that even possible? He's saying, yeah. So it's, he starts out with Jesus and uses the example of Jesus laying down his life and says, we should do that. And again, that's kind of easy for us to look at because we don't think of, although for them, it might, it was more of a possibility that we would do that. But then he really gets to, he says, okay, let's talk about the reality on, on a more personal basis. Yeah. It's even more difficult. Let's just say you have stuff and a brother or sister in Christ doesn't. Are you willing to part with it for their good? Yeah. And that becomes, it's a smaller thing, but you say you'll do the greater thing. And Jesus <laughs> said to do that. If Jesus said you should give your life, then you should also be willing to give some a few bucks or give some of your stuff to someone, to, not to someone, to a brother or sister who needs it. And uh, I think John's really, these two verses, I think just really brings, to a certain extent, brings the hammer down and says, okay, yeah. let, let's look at real application right here and now. And this is where, if you're listening to this, you kind of have to swallow it deeply and say, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I failed there. Yeah. I would even say it's a very practical expression of laying down your life. We, we, we may be called upon. We may be called upon. Uh, we don't know, but we may be called upon to actually deliver our bodies to be burned, like Paul would say in, in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, that, that, that might be a possibility. Um, but there are other ways that we lay down our lives. It's not always death in that physical sense. You know, Jesus was unique in that way um, because his death was that we might have life and have it more abundantly. But that very practical expression, and I don't, I don't want to get away from a broader understanding of righteousness, but if we think about righteousness being in the background here, that's, that's a really, really big part of, of doing justly is when you see that brother who's in need. Um, I, I, had, I had jotted down um, uh, Proverbs. Uh, I think it's Proverbs chapter 3 where um, it even talks about, I think it's 327 where, where it talks about if, you, if, you, if, you, if it's within your power to do good, do it. And, and the way that it speaks about it in, in Proverbs, Proverbs, it's as if that's that that's your neighbor's due. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't like to think about that way in, in our hyper individualistic culture, um, but we think about that within the the body of Christ, and and we have this common life together. And no, we're not the church of a, a, in in Jerusalem in Acts where we're taking all our possessions and we're laying them at the apostles' feet. We're, we're not doing that. Um, and that wasn't wrong for them to do. That's what God prompted them to do. But there is the reality that in, in, the, in, the, in the family of faith, when, when there is a need like that, a legitimate one, then we are, we are under obligation because of the love of Christ to, to seek to meet that need. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's do them in, in that sense. And, and just that language, um, uh, you had the Christian standard translating that withholds compassion. Mm-hmm. right closes closes his bowels to him right so instead of being moved by that I, I i close myself off to it and it's like i just turn the other way and i totally ignore there there yet yet jesus repeatedly when he when he sees people we, we see that in right after the sermon on the mountain matthew he he sees people and he's moved with what for them He's moved with compassion for them. Um, so I think that's why John can say, how, how can the love of God uh, uh, abide in that person? And of course, as soon as we talk about it, it's like there are a thousand fingers pointing at me. <laughs> I think, I think very, something we, we need to consider here is it's not the act that's being addressed. It's the attitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he is not suggesting that the way you love is you give all your goods. Right. It is, you see the need, you have compassion, and you minister to that need by your compassion. I would also say that just in in viewing this, 
uh, and I think you, you alluded to it, I, I might have heard one of you say this, that verse 17 is a practical illustration, but it's not the entire illustration. Right. Because if I love my brethren, uh, there are times when I restrain my speech. That's right. Or I might speak. Sure. Yeah. Because I see a person in need, or I see a person being slandered, or I see a person being, uh, that's a demonstration of love. Yeah. Right. So this is not the only illustration of it. It is just not at all. an illustration of, yep. of this right. being here. Right. Yep. And, and it comes back with that emphatic statement in, in verse 18, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. In truth. Uh, can, I, can I be facetious here? Can we edit this next portion out? <laughs> uh, it's not how many Facebook posts you have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I think sometimes we, we, we're very good on the verbal part yeah. without the follow-up. Yeah. yeah, and, and I've been reading through James in this last this verse eighteen just remind me of that. If, if faith without works is dead, yeah, then love without action is dead as well. Uh, yeah. it, it's empty love in the same way it's empty faith that say, says you have it, but your life isn't demonstrated. If you say you love, but the reality is your actions, your deeds never show that, then that love yeah. doesn't exist. Um, it's it's not real. Let's tackle the last part of this chapter uh, so that we kind of stay within some good time restraints here. Yeah. Uh, he writes this, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and treasure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if your, our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Mm -hmm. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandment abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Yeah. This is not a comfortable or an easy <laughs> read. Mm -mm. So, since I'm the senior pastor, I tell you guys to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know verses 19 and 20 are, are difficult and, and yeah. uh, in the way and the, and the grammatical. And, and They're difficult to translate, yeah. They all use different words, in fact, in verse 19 for, the, and this is how we know that we belong to the truth. And in the CSB, it says, reassure our hearts. I think yours yep. is treasure our hearts. What does it say in ESV, Tony? Um, I, in the ESV, it's uh, reassure, um, set our hearts at rest is a rendering that I've seen in, I think, the NIV, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, and so it's it, it's a thing, you know, how do we know that we belong to the truth? And and uh, whenever our heart condemns us, and there's the question, what, you know, what does that mean? And I've seen two different things that possibly, when we have doubts, but part of those doubts may arise from our own sin and from the conviction that we have concerning yeah. sin in our lives. Um, which, of course, non-believers really don't have, but as believers, we do, that when our hearts condemn us, we look at it, how can I do that and be a believer? How can I not do what I'm supposed to yeah. do and be a believer? Um, and our hearts condemn us, that it's easy at that point to begin questioning our our salvation, questioning our really belong yeah. to God. The reality is, that's an indication that we probably do. Because again, non-believers would never that would not even cross their mind yeah. to do that. And for God is greater, and again in CSB it says, For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows all things. And yeah. and it goes back to can you rest in the assurance of what God has said and what, what John's already talked about in relationship to your love and your action? Uh, because Romans 8 31 to 34 is a great place where it says, you know, nothing's gonna change God's love for us and our assurance, and we are yeah. guaranteed in that. The, you know, I, I thought it was, as I was reading this initially, I wrote down the truth of God overrides our truth or feelings. Um, that there is, this is what God says, and it doesn't matter how I feel at this particular moment or what I think in, you know, to use the world's language, what my truth is, which of course doesn't truly exist, but we still <laughs> use that language in our culture. So, yeah. but God's truth overrides all of that because it's greater than our hearts that make condemn us. It says, no, you are mine if this is true of you. 
Okay. Uh, and never does he take out. In fact, John has already given accommodation for when we sin, what we do, we, we, we confess it before God. And indeed, yep. we, we have his forgiveness. And that's a truth that, yep. uh, that is greater than our hearts. He knows all things and he knows who we, if we truly are his. Yep. Um, but I think that it, it, it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting passage because then in verse 21, he goes immediately to dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, he, well, he just said our hearts condemn us. We're well, saying, I think if you come to the point where you're resting in what God says mm -hmm. about what is true, then you approach God with confidence. You have that confidence before God. Um, and, and that's really a beautiful picture. As you think about it, as John taking them through. And again, a very pastoral thing. I see him just trying to reassure the, these yeah. To these believers who may now be doubting a little bit concerning their their love is do, do i love my brothers and sisters enough yep. and say, no 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 that's that's not my intent my intent is not to destroy you my intent is not to pull the rug out from underneath your feet yeah uh this is this is obvious and i want you to know the truth of god overrides this and you still should have confidence before god because his truth is greater than what you may feel or think which yep. is so up and down at times. I think, I think, Doug, when you say that, we ought to add a little extra layer in there, too, that when it condemns us, God is greater than that. His truth is greater than that. There is a comfort. There's also just a slight warning in there Yeah. that uh, be careful that you're not just saying, I am okay because my heart is, I think my heart's right. Uh, God's bigger than your heart. And uh, I, I'm reminded in scripture that the, the, the everything. heart is a very deceitful thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. So there, there is a little bit of a warning in that comfort as well, which yeah. I, ironically I find in scripture all the time, conviction and comfort go together. Yeah. And they, they really yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it seems, it, it seems that the goal is for us to be in a place where our hearts do not condemn us. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, one commentator uh, pointed out that there is legitimate guilt that we sometimes have mm -hmm. because we've not been loving the brothers very well. I mean, we, we love them, but maybe it's been more more talk than action. Um, but there's also illegitimate guilt where we we have we have that savior complex and we're supposed to save the world and we're just not doing enough. Mm -hmm right when the reality is we can't do it all yeah. and and even when we do uh it's still not going to be enough uh so you know we we have to wrestle with that we have to wrestle with that in prayer uh to to kind of discern that and it, i'm not trying to call us into a, a overly uh morbid introspection with that um but that reality too that that god knows everything that if it's legitimate guilt, the Lord knows our hearts even better than we do. And he knows more about us than we do. Um, but that goes back to if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It goes back to uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So there's a necessity of repentance and confession in that. But then, but then you see as you walk down that that assurance seems to be very strongly linked to love for the brothers. And then there seems to be this correspondence between um, that our hearts being at rest, our hearts being assured and the boldness with which we pray. Yeah, there, there is a, a boldness here. We have confidence before God, whatever we ask, we receive from him because his commandment and we do what pleases him. Uh, Doug, you said that he brought in the heavy guns earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. Verse 23 is a heavy gun for me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. That if we believe in the name of the Jesus Christ and, and we love one another, just as he commanded us. Um, yeah. That Then you have that assurance, whoever keeps his command abides in God and God in him. By this we know. There's mm -hmm. another we know mm -hmm. that we have in here. So there's a lot of assurances in here that are biblical assurances that mm -hmm. ought to be part of our walk before the Lord, our examination before the Lord, yeah. uh, and trusting in his, his truth in this. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I find it interesting, verse 23, that, that it's singular. Now, this is the, his commandment. But then we yeah. see two things. Two things. <laughs> and I think the fact is, and it's all different people saying different things. Saying, well, it really means two separate things. I, I don't think so. I, I think that he means yeah. these are kind of not one and the same, but they naturally flow that we believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ and we love one another as he commanded us. Because John's equated those things. If you... Yeah. If you believe in Christ, if you are in Christ, if you if you abide in Him, then you then you absolutely do love one another. And so this is not two separate things. It's like, well, I can do this, but not this. John says, no, you understand. This is one thing. Believing and abiding in Christ also means loving your brothers and sisters, yeah. and that is just right. that's the way it goes. It's two things, but it's one, and yeah. it's, it's one thing you do. That they're inseparable. You yep. can't do, say, I, I abide in Christ, but I don't love my brothers and sisters. That doesn't, he said already earlier, that doesn't work. It parallels very much, it parallels very much the, the question that was given to Jesus of what's the greatest commandment. Mm -hmm. And he says the one that you would expect, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And the second is likened unto it, right? Mm -hmm. You'll love your neighbor as yourself. And it, it's sort of a similar I think it's 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 very similar there, but they're they're inseparable. Mm -hmm. um, he does say the second is like an unto it, but it's almost like one and one a. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, guys, we're about the end of the time. So, what are we going to take away from this passage? Silence. Well, there's a there's a real challenge to love, mm -hmm. and uh, actively. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, uh, I think it's really easy to to sit and and say, "Well, I'm I'm loving my brothers and sisters." Um, this is just me, okay. Uh, but how many times have I thought maybe I should just give that brother or sister a call, see how they're doing, or maybe just write a note? and say, I'm thinking of you and, and I'm praying for you or just asking the question, what can I do for you? Is, is there a need that, that the Lord, that I can use of the Lord to help me today? Uh, instead of, <laughs> instead of sitting in, in my office and keeping my nose in a book, I mean, that that's the challenge for me. Mm. Yeah. And mine is, uh, is like unto it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> In that, you know, I was thinking, it doesn't matter how much doctrine we know or even how right our doctrine is. And these mm -hmm. are because we're seeing so many of these debates and, you know, who's <laughs> got the right doctrine? And certainly mm -hmm. doctrine matters. And, and all of us would absolutely agree with that. We, mm -hmm. we, and, and John would agree with that. We've got to believe the, the right thing. Yeah. But the right doctrine without the love that comes with that, without, yeah. um, it is empty. It's it, it's not worth anything. It's simply head knowledge that I know the yeah. right stuff. Maybe I can argue and debate the right stuff, but the proof comes in how I live it out. Um, whether I do the things like like Tony said in relationship to love, or whatever it looks like to love my brothers and sisters within the body. Um, what does that really look like, and do I do that? So it doesn't matter if I know a whole bunch of stuff, but I don't love an action. I don't love indeed and truth. Um, yeah then it, it really doesn't matter. And so that means many times for me, stepping out of my comfort zone um, as an introvert and being not that I'm called to be an extrovert because I'm not, but, <laughs> but I am called to, to, to share love. And many times yeah. that means words of encouragement. That means offering to you know help with different things, but it's doing those things and yeah. doing them in the right spirit, doing them because I truly love yep. my brothers and sisters. It's not a pretense. It's not putting it on because um, God's going to see right through that. Um, he's going to see my heart. And, but it's in, in a genuine attitude to love them. And I do it because I love God. And these are fellow believers. These are fellow people who have passed from death into life. And uh, I'm going to spend eternity with them. And uh, I, I, I should start loving them now in, in a yep. very real, real way. Um, 
And that's, I mean, it, kind of what Tony said, but it, it really is, it really is convicting. Uh, I think that the question, that's a practical question, is Lord, who do you want me to love today that you have loved as a demonstration of my love for you yeah. and a part of your love for me? Yeah. If anyone is listening to this today and is sitting there and is saying, no one has loved me, mm -hmm. you are in the wrong position. Uh, you have already taken this passage the wrong way. Mm -hmm. This is not who is loving me, but who am I loving? Yeah. And so that was would be one thing that I would say to people. The other thing I would say to people is you might say, I don't see this kind of love among the brethren. And I would say, perhaps you're not close enough in fellowship with the yeah. brethren to yeah. see yeah. the love, because a lot of it is not on public display, yeah. but it is there within the fellowship. So, And I'm not going to name names, but, but we have had the joy, I think the three of us, mm -hmm. of seeing that kind of love really being expressed in the last week or two with yes. between some families in our congregation and just how encouraging that's been to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that if I turn the question, make sure the question is, Lord, who do you want me to love today that you have loved as a sign of my love for you and as a demonstration of your love for me mm -hmm. and make it a very personal application. I think that this has benefit for us. Uh, this is a, a very, as I said, a comforting but convicting portion mm -hmm. of, of Scripture. If you have watched this today and you have questions about your relationship with Christ, we invite you to contact us at Sycamore Hills Baptist Church. Our website is www.shbc.net. Leave us a message. We'll get back in touch with you. Uh, we would love to dialogue with you and love to talk with you about that. We're going to continue in our study of the letters of John, and we invite you just to keep track of our roundtables. You can go back and see the previous ones that lead up to this point that might help you put the entire letter together in a, uh, uh, a passage. We do not claim to be experts. In fact, <laughs> if it prompts you to study, we are excited about that. So uh, we just want you to know Christ and know him as the true Messiah the one who's redeemed mm -hmm. you through his shed blood. Thank you guys for being in this session. And I'm going to close this out with a word of prayer. And we invite you again to join us as we continue through First John. Father, thank you for these convicting words and comforting words. Thank you that we can love each other because you have first loved us. Mm -hmm. And we've experienced that in our children of God because of the deep, deep love that you have given to us. We know love by this, that Christ gave his life for us. Mm -hmm. And we rejoice in that and thank you for it. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us.